Welcome to the March 7th edition of the PFF Forecast. This is a good one. We have a really exciting guest lined up for Wednesday. So it's just Eric and I today. But this show is a lot of fun because we're going to do draft props and then we're going to do NFC North win totals. We're going to guess the win totals, talk about the current odds for the division. In there, between somewhere, is going to be a little Russell Wilson Bears talk, uh, which should be fun and exciting. So let's rock. Draft props, finally. Are they, are they earlier this season? They feel like they've come out a little earlier. They do. Um, well, you have to remember, this time last year, you were still... I can't remember yeah, this time it's last It's like, uh, yeah, it, the, there was a story regarding your birthday where I'm like, oh, we got to get this George this for his birthday. So I went back and looked at the DM your lovely girlfriend, Samantha, sent me, and, and I was like, it felt like two months ago. Yeah. And I look at the date, it's like March 19th or whatever. And I'm like, wait a sec. We've simultaneously been in the longest year of all time and the shortest year of all time. But at this time last year, the XFL, this was the last week XFL played. So there's still people betting on that. Um, and then basketball still hadn't been canceled. The, the, the tournament hadn't. So, so I think there was a lot less attention there. But then when people found out when there was nothing to bet on but draft props and free agency props, um, that people were really engaged by that. So I think they've started a little earlier this year. There usually was just sort of like the novelty, like who would be picked number one um, and, and stuff like that, which we're getting here. But we're starting to get some things trickle in. For example, the thing I'm going to write about this week, which is uh, one Mac Jones. Yeah, draft uh, his, position. His draft position. Man. But there's a ton of other opportunities here uh, to, to make money uh, if you're willing to tie your money up for a couple months. I'm very excited to hear your opinion on Mac Jones and talk about it because I think this is a ridiculous line. Um, the other thing that I was going to point out is, so the NBA All-Star Game is tonight. We're recording this on Sunday. Um, and it's crazy to think back a year ago, it was like Rudy, Rudy Gobert Day, right, is what set everything off. Mm -hmm. And you were telling a story before we even started the podcast about how um, when Ru Rudy Gobert sent everything off, the only thing left sports-wise on TV yeah. was a golf tournament. And you went to a sports book, and that was, you know how there's like 50 screens, you can see every sport, the only sport up there was golf. Yeah, I, I mean, up. yeah, because they, they closed down everything, right? Yeah. So I figured if I'm going to get my money from these this sports book, I better go now and, and cash out. And I, I took a picture of like the TVs, because there was literally nothing on. And I mean, we were in such a dark, remember, remember how popular, and it would have been popular anyway, for sure, because it was brilliantly made and, all, and, and everything. Remember how popular the Jordan documentary was? Yeah, it was like dance. literally the only thing we all watched Everyone for, looked forward for to months. It. Yeah, it was incredible. Sunday nights. Were, or when, uh, was it Tom they, Brady they, and uh, man, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Tiger Woods, and Phil Mickelson golfed? That was like another one. Where it was a it was huge just, event. It was humongous. And they pushed up the last dance in order mm -hmm. to, they hadn't actually finished cutting all of the last couple of episodes when they started it. Um, all right, let's talk some draft props. Let's start with Mac Jones. So on DraftKings Sportsbook right now, it's minus 112, both sides of 17 and a half. Oh, did it? Because I've seen it move even more. I looked an hour ago. It was 17 and a half on DraftKings. Okay, because... And I cannot tell you how... I, I don't understand how... 17... He's going in the top 10. Well, okay. So I, I posted this on Twitter on Thursday or Friday. It was 18. Right, it's moved. Equal juice on both sides that day. Um, on my Twitter poll, I got about two to one people who said under, um, and uh, and then since that, it's moved to seventeen and a half. And in fact, where I see it, under seventeen is minus one twenty four. So people are even going underneath that. And I think a lot of people believe what you believe, which is, you know, you get the top, you know, like the top three might go top three. That'd be the first time since nineteen ninety nine. Then you have Trey Lance, who's probably going to go fourth, but there's no guarantee there. And then Mac Jones, and with all the teams that need a quarterback, you know you could conceivably see them moving up. The the thing that I'll back up the truck with though, is this is we've seen this kind of happen before. So 2018, um, 
I remember doing the draft show with you here, right? Mm-hmm. And Lamar Jackson's prop was 16 and a half was his draft position. Mm-hmm. And I remember the Saints trading up into pick 15 or 16. And we all thought that was for Lamar Jackson. It ended up being Marcus Davenport. And Lamar went at 32. The prop that year, the number of uh, quarterbacks in the first round was five and a half. And if you bet over that, obviously, is a failure. But it, it, it got five only at pick 32. Uh, wind a year after that, Drew Locke. Many, many people mocked him in the first round, went to the second round. Um, year before 2018, Deshaun Kaiser, the fourth quarterback, goes in the second round. I think that there, and this is why I think if you're going to look at this, you want to look at both markets. I, I think under 17 and a half is right. But I also think if you look at the number of quarterbacks taken in round one and you look at four and a half, it's currently going off at four to one. I think, over, I think, I think under four and a half at four to one is a good play on sort of the, the tail risk of like one of those quarterbacks sort of falling completely out of round one. Okay. Uh, let me counter. So the quarterbacks that you mentioned all had issues throwing the football, right? Mm-hmm. That's the one thing Mac Jones does not have an issue with. And to not only does he not have an issue with it, he's great at throwing the football. He's incredibly accurate. He's probably a little more mobile than people are giving him credit for relative to the fact that they're comparing him to the other quarterbacks who are all pretty darn mobile. So it's not as if he's like completely incapable of motion. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he's not uh, a total statue in the pocket. So I think he fits into more systems than people will give him credit for. But the dude is absolutely, he's incredibly accurate. He understands where he's going with the football. And there are teams, I heard through uh, the grapevine, there are NFL teams that don't think he's getting outside of the top six. Really? That's, I mean, that's excellent for the state of the quarterback uh, understanding of the league, right? I mean, I, I just, here's a question. I just I, think that what you're, when you're comparing him to Drew Locke or Deshaun Kaiser, you're looking at quarterbacks where it's like, I have no idea if he could throw the ball accurately against decent competition, sure. much less, at, you know, at, at the SEC level. And Mac Jones has proven that. The only reason that you would not take him higher than the other guys is because of the mobility factor. But that's a totally different, yeah. you know, that's like a, a luxury, not a, a stand, like a, you have to meet this bar. To, to but don't you think people are sort of talking themselves into Mac Jones in a way that we've seen people talk? And like, again, I don't want to equate these, but I'm trying to make a qualitative statement here. People were trying to talk themselves into Mason Rudolph in 2018. And because that's why that that number was set at five and a half, because there were there were chatter that Mason Rudolph would go in the first round, like near the back end because of the fifth year option, which we're finding out is not as big of a deal as people believe. Um, So but I agree. I mean, look, I, I when I see Mac Jones, I see I see Kirk Cousins. I see Jimmy Garoppolo. And the, the fact of the matter is, if you can get one of those guys on a rookie the, deal for, on the rookie deal um, in a good situation, you would Look, take it. I wrote this in my notes. We're going to talk about the NFC North in a second, but I literally wrote this out. I said, if you can get Mac Jones at what are the Vikings 14, mm-hmm. you take Mac Jones. Why? I mean, because he's so much more valuable on a rookie deal than Kirk Cousins is going to be for you, not this year, but over the next four years. And you're not a team. You've won seven games last year, nine games. How many did they win? Seven? They won seven and nine? Seven and nine, yep. yeah. They won seven games last year with Kirk Cousins. Like, you think you're just making this leap to – to 12 and four. No, the way that you're doing that is by building a team that's so strong around your, your valuable quarterback I, who's cheap. Can I, okay, so one. So adi- under 17 and a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a- additional pushback here though. Do you think the, the possible mobility of quarterbacks in the veteran market this year impacts this number? So if you if you're betting. So are you talking about Russell and, and Deshaun Watson? I, well, and, and, and adding to that so if you're looking at so Watson to me we talked about this I was wrong I think I thought Houston would find a way to make it work it does not look like it's me the case by the way they managed to fuck it up are you saying you believed in the Houston Texans (laughs) by the way they managed to fuck it up even worse now because Russell Wilson's in the conversation which it shouldn't but it kind of degrades Watson's value just a little bit here and there because a team like Chicago can go and say, well, actually, we care about, like, we like, Will, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, there's maybe. a, they managed to fuck it up by, by waiting this long. But, but you have those two guys, but you also have, this is, you also have 
Cousins. You also have Garoppolo. You also have Carr. And not to say that they're going to move, but it does – the the, op, the possibility. So let's say let's say the – all of those dominoes fall in the middle of March, late March. Does that change Mac Jones' stature? The only reason I would say no is that those players are currently starting quarterbacks for, for teams right now. Mm-hmm. So even if they were to move, there's still a team now that's out there that now needs a starting but, quarterback. But teams that have those. So Jimmy, so Jimmy G moves, right? Yeah. Th- that means that now there's a starting quarterback opening in San Francisco. There's not a surplus of quarterbacks yeah. to the point where you have like two or three starters on one team. You know what I'm saying? So like if one of those guys moves, there's just going to be another open slot. Yeah, but but by virtue, so Watson does Watson isn't this way although they they don't have the pick though. Um but for example, I guess Las Vegas is at 17. That's where the thought process like but a guy like Wilson if he leaves Seattle, that team because Wilson's good is not picking. Well, they're not picking the first round at all, but they're not, you know, but they're my, getting a pick for him. They're getting a pick for him. Ah, that's true. But the, and then the teams that are that's, trading that's are going to be so, weaker than 17. So it might even make it more likely that that Mac Jones goes in the top 17 picks if those guys get traded. I am hammering under 17 and okay. a half. Okay. I mean, that's great. Um, Thank you. And, and here's a question. <laughs> and, here, and here's sort of like, I don't think we're going to wrap this up, but here's, here's to sort of put something onto the draft process. Sauce. The, the point of right now, the point of right now for draft props is not to be right. The point of draft props right now. Get yourself a little, yeah. little value. Yeah. What the are we having for draft- dinner tonight, honey? Well, actually, we're having Cleve. Yeah, yeah. With a, uh, of, a little side of cleave. The point of draft props right now it's closing line value, is to is way. to get a decent amount of money on a position that will that you can sort of scrape off of as the as the season goes on, right? Like last year, what was it? Isaiah Isaiah Wilson, sorry, um, Isaiah Simmons was like seven and a half was his draft prop, and there were all these talks about the Giants taking him, the Giants taking him, the Giants taking him. So if you bet under that consistently it got all the way down to like six and a half Mm -hmm. and so you could come back over the top with some over and you're in you can oftentimes put 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 yourself into a only profit situation it was the same thing with the mac jones thing when it was 18 and a half i mean even if you thought as i kind of i still kind of do that there's a significant chance that he or lance go later Mm -hmm. You have to. The only side was under because that was what everybody else was thinking. And it's going to move. That and way. so then, and the same thing at seventeen and a half. Like this thing's probably going to settle in at fifteen and a half, fourteen and a half, thirteen and a half. So I mean, we saw guys fall that far during the during the draft prop season. And the reason to get yourself on a seventeen and a half under is so that when it gets to some agree, like let's say it got to an egregious number, it like probably what if, won't. What if it got to twelve and a half? Yeah, exactly. So you left. You leave yourself in a position where. You, you only have a, a profitable middle in, in, in many ways. Mm. No. Okay, I have some other ones that uh, I want to talk about. The next one I'd like to talk about. So I was looking at some Zach Wilson stuff. So one of the nice things about draft props is there's actually a fair amount of difference between the books that you go to. So if you're looking at number two pick, for example, there are places where Zach Wilson is minus 300, and there are places where it's below minus 200. Like I think points bet has him at minus 170. Um, to As, go second? To go second. So, like, if you if you find that, go go grab it. Yeah. But I also thought this one was interesting. Um, I think this one was on – was this my bookie? I can't remember where I found this. But uh, I found, old, an old friend. An old friend. I found Zach Wilson, second quarterback taken. Notice the difference. So if the Jets galaxy brain themselves into taking a non-quarterback at two, which I think is a legit possibility, yeah. if you get Zach Wilson, second quarterback taken at minus 200, which is what I found it at, I think both of those are absolute no-brainers. Yeah, I mean, so so one of the places we saw, because um, I I got Wilson at minus one sixty-seven to go second, second. overall, mm-hmm. and then there were and that moved out to minus three hundred five on DraftKings for a while. There was a stray minus one sixty on FanDuel for a few weeks, and they moved it out to one ninety. Finally, got it out to minus two sixty over the course of the weekend. Again, those are the situations where – and look – You have limits, a soft place in your heart for strays, stray dogs, <laughs> stray bats. The, the, the limits aren't big enough necessarily on some of these for the books to be all that worried right. about, like, somebody trying to middle them. Um, so – but at the same time, like, again, now 
Now, if you're sitting on a bet, which is the implied odds or the implied break even is, you know, 75% and you're sitting on one that is just a little over 60%, you're getting yourself a huge advantage here. And then if the, t- if the time comes where you hear something as you're want to do, or you get a hunch and you think that that hunch is worthwhile for a second overall pick, let's say Panay Sewell comes up. Yeah. Well, then you can get yourself some Panay Sewell because Panay Sewell, by the very nature of Zach Wilson being minus 305, is going to be way more than that. And then you have yourself an opportunity to have, if you think those two are the only two that be, can be picked, a riskless bet there. Um, what Do you have others on your list? I was going to. I mean, I like, I mean, I still think that this is bettable. It's starting to get to a point where, um, it's starting to get to a point where I don't like it anymore, but. Jamar Chase to be the first wide receiver taken is minus 167. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year is distinct from last year. Last year, Judy and uh, Lamb, I think, were both rightfully seen as equals as mm-hmm. the top two receivers in the draft. Mm-hmm. And then Henry Ruggs sort of snuck in there. Um, I think right now it's Smith and Waddle who are sort of tied, but they're tied for number two. I yeah. think Jamar Chase is viewed rightly as the number one receiver. So I'm not that worried about laying that price. If I'm going to look to try in one of these first X drafted markets, I'm not looking at wide receiver. I'm going to look somewhere else. I think Chase is the easy choice here. And just like with all these other ones, this number I think is only going to grow. I have some Chase uh, that I like on some, like some plus price bets that I want to run by you. So at number three, the Miami Dolphins sit there. Okay, Let's say that the, your, your Houston Texans can't figure it out okay and Miami sits there at three they're staying with Tua and they go you know let's take you know say say they don't want to take Panay Sewell they go Jamar Chase Um, Jamar Chase to be the number three overall pick uh, is somewhere in the plus 350 to plus 450 range and I that's I wait a sec George I was told on our mock draft I was told that there's no way Jamar Chase goes four, let right. alone three. Right. I mean, look, the Atlanta Falcons fans have never been wrong about anything. I do think so. The number three overall pick, Justin Fields, plus 200, Panay Sewell, plus 250, Devontae Smith, plus 300, Jamar Chase, plus 350, which is a little incongruous, uh, incongruent with the Jamar Chase being the first wide receiver off the board. So I like that. Um, and I think it's clear cut that he's the number one wide receiver. But you could also get him at 16 to 1 to be the second overall pick. I am riding the New York Jets doing something massively stupid, staying at two and taking a non quarterback. I'm just like riding with that narrative. I don't know why. I mean, I don't think it's that. It's just, I've got a feeling. Yeah, I, I hope not. I mean, I have, I laid a big price on Sewell being the number one lineman taken um, just because, uh, unlike a season ago, I think that there's a humongous gap between mm-hmm. him. People are talking about Slater playing guard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think there's a lot of – the weird thing is I think there's a lot of good linemen in the draft, um, but I don't think that there's anybody there's that rivals, su- that that, rivals yeah. Sewell. Let me, let me ask you this. Okay, so there's no combine, right? But there are these pro days. So Henry Ruggs and his combine performance was really what pushed him ahead of guys in Judy and Lamb who both had some question marks that Chase does not have. Let's say Jalen Waddle, who's seven to one to be the first wide receiver taken, runs four two. What is the, his price after that? Say he puts on an absolute clinic in a pro day. I think pro days are going to. I think we're going to overcorrect in in ignoring pro days. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you don't think the market moves that much? No. Okay. So you know, I, I think the combine is a spectacle. So this is this was the risk the NFL took, I think, and I and I actually think the risk was significant. The NFL is such a spectacle because of the lack of engagement it requires from its viewers. Mm-hmm. So you you watch games Thursday, Sunday, Monday, and and basically that's all you have to do to be a well engaged fan. You start decentralizing some of that stuff. And I think people fall off really quickly. They just can't figure it out. And I think smart people will go to pff.com, get yourself an elite subscription, and read the article about pro day and combine statistics where it says you should be very, very, very hesitant about uh, not, not just pro day scores, but pro day scores that are very good, right? Like 
a lineman running 40s are going to be the same, both both of them, because there's no incentive for, like, this school. Mm-hmm. Now, the pro days that we're getting now are more automated and things like that, but they're still decentralized. So I think that that's going to be – I think that people are going to undervalue these pro days immensely, especially on the betting market, which might mean if you respond to them, then yeah. there, there, there could be some value for I, you. I will behind. say this, though. We are in an age where it's easier to get the video out you know, so while that's true, it will, if he has an incredible pro day, it will circulate like wildfire in the same way that it could have before. Are we though, I agree. Are we maybe thinking though a little bit differently about, so like the the stuff, this, the, the, the training camp videos that circulate on Twitter, eventually with these pro, I think that that's a smaller sliver of the NFL fan base and the NFL betting community than we believe. I think that's fair. Okay, I have one more that I really like. This is first running back drafted, Najee Harris plus 100. Travis Etienne is the betting favorite, like minus 120. Um, I just, I can just see it right now. Najee Harris, he's a big dude. Derrick Henry, but he can catch too. He looks like Mark Ingram kind of too. Like they're just like, I'll take all the Alabama backs. Put them into one. Put them into one. And draft it's Najee Harris. Four. Yeah. Um, and so I like that. I, I also like Javante Williams, who's probably the best running back in the draft, yep. is 7-1. to one. Uh, That's the one. I, that's the first X-picked underdog that I bet. Yeah. I, I like Javante Williams at 7-1. to one. I think you're, people are going to watch him play. And the other thing about him that's great, what was the thing about Alvin Kamara that when you first saw him play in New Orleans, what was you said, oh, my God, this guy's amazing. But then, what's, the, what's the second thing you, 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 you thought to yourself? Ooh, I had a lot of thoughts the first time I watched Alvin Kamara. The first was, holy shit. Only PG, though. This guy's balance is incredible. (laughs) Um, I thought, man, he can catch the ball, and he forces a heck of a lot of missed tackles. And then you go look at, and you go say, oh, wow, he wasn't used a whole lot at Tennessee. That's the one I'm thinking about, because even though, um, so Kamara at Tennessee had 210 combined carries, um, Javante Williams... A little bit more. So he had 366 um, carries during that time, um, but never more than 166 in a season. Um, he ever t- 6.3 yards per attempt at college. I mean, he's insane. unbelievable. But you're looking at a guy who's not a lot of tread on the tires. And if you're going to – they asked me this question on, on the serious PFF Serious XM show Friday. When would you draft a running back? And if he was like, the, if he was like a Saquon Barkley type. And I said, no earlier than 33rd. And I said, the reason why is I want no incentive to sign into a second deal. None. I want no, I don't want to give myself the opportunity to be like, look, we got a first round draft pick and he worked. You know, I I want none of that. But if you are going to take a running back in the second round, to me, it's got to be a guy who has all the things Javante Williams has and doesn't have the workload uh, that that some of these other guys have coming like like Jonathan Taylor had a great rookie year and had a great college career but like you're th- you're you're getting on to what like you're probably 2000 touches relatively soon I'll say this I I did my homework here which means I went to the PFF NFL draft guide which is the greatest place to find out anything about any of these prospects I read through all the running backs I say this with confidence I'm not saying where I would take them but I say with pretty darn good confidence that the first running back I would I would take is Javante Williams. Dude is mm-hmm. insane. Um, okay, let's go to – so we're going to go NFC North here. But to preface this, so we're going to guess the win totals here. I have a question for you, which is, do you think there exists a trade package that the Bears could put together? They have the 20th overall pick. They have no quarterbacks of value. Is there a trade package that the Bears could put together that the Seahawks would actually accept? That the Seahawks would accept? Yes. What is it? Um. Uh. Let me let me look. Okay. Let me let me give you one. Okay. Okay. Because I, I have one. Because I, I look. I think the Seahawks bar is lower than our bar. I'm. That was kind of what I was getting at. Um. Which is which is funny. <laughs> okay. So, Khalil Mack, Jalen Johnson, number twenty, first rounder next year, second rounder either this year or next year. So here's where I bristle a little bit at the idea of players. But it doesn't matter if they get – so it's weird because the this, the Seahawks are barely under the cap and the Bears are a little over the cap. So I can understand why the Bears would want to unload players. 
but Seattle can't necessarily take a ton in because of their cap situation and the fact that a lot of what Wilson is going to cost is going to be in the dead money space. So they're not going to save that much by getting rid of him at least in year one. But I agree. I like. But at the same time, like some of these things that they can chip away at won't piss Russ off because he's gone. Mm-hmm. So so, yeah. I mean, the Bears have good football players. Max, a good football player, obviously. Uh, Eddie Jackson's a but, good football player. So that was why I included Mac because Mac makes a, a ton of money. Yeah. I'm not sure how would the Bears would the Bears have to tag and trade like Allen Robinson to make well, they the can't, money work? Yeah, the tag and trade isn't because yeah. they don't even have enough money under the cap. Like they have to, they would have to make significant moves just to just to apply the tag to Robinson. Like True. they have to be under the cap. True. Uh, like I mean, that was kind of why I included m- players because Russ makes a ton of money as well. Um, yeah. The other, interesting but the players, thing is, the players have to fit under Seattle's cap, which would make it a little. True. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's more going to have to be draft picks. Okay. So and then, Pace doesn't care. Okay, by the but, way, but here's the problem: the Bears have number twenty this year. Yeah. They get Russell Wilson. What's their pick next year? Right. I mean, you'd think, given that division, it's like in the 30s. Well, at least past (laughs) 20, right? So are you really willing – let's say the Bears offer you their next three first-round picks. Are you that excited about 20, 25, and 27? No, you'd have to package it with significant other picks. But then, I mean – That's why I'm not sure if they can get it done I have no clue what Seattle's thinking here because it doesn't make sense for me – because you're basically the thing you can say is, if we lose Russ, we're not going to be a good football team in year one. And they've done that before. 2011 was was Carroll. 2010 was Carroll's first year. 2011 was Carroll's second year. They went to the playoffs, won a game, the Beastquake game in yep. 2010. They took a huge step back in 2011, not record wise, but just like stature wise, by signing Tavares Jackson and starting him the whole season. So they've done the whole like take right. a step back yes. and make a step forward situation. If you're Seattle and you're trading Russ. You're saying, well, I'm getting three picks in the back end of the first round to pair with my two or three picks in the front end of the first round. That's going to result from the fact that we don't have one of the best five quarterbacks in football anymore. But you need a quarterback. Do you in year one? No, but what are you getting in year two? Well, that's but in year two, are you, you ha- tanking? I think so. Oh, that that's be- not happening. I'm sorry. Pete Carroll is not tanking. If you look at that division. And I get, I get what we would do. Yeah, yeah. I'm just telling you right now that Pete Carroll. But then, but then you're just you're, we're running circles into the truth that Wilson's not going anywhere. Like that's what I think we're getting at. Where do you think the? Okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, you're we're redrafting the NFL right now. Russ Wilson is where on your board? Uh, if you include money. Um, let's let's screw money. Just. Oh, uh, if, if, if price wasn't an, an, an issue, he's third. Okay. The point is he's top five. Yeah. I think I would probably push him maybe closer to five. Yeah. With the money, I would consider guys like Herbert and, uh, you know, Burrow, Burrow and yeah. the guys like that ahead of him just because they're cheaper and, and have high upside. I'm kind of trying to get at, like, just out of quarterbacks in the NFL, like, where does he rank? What do you think the Seahawks – believe Russell Wilson given that they almost traded him to the Browns for the first round pick just two years ago three years ago now uh I think they probably view him more like Like seventh Pete Pete Carroll sits there and goes well I've got I've got the 10th best quarterback in the league all because they lost a barn burner in Arizona like honestly that Arizona game not only screwed us out of a bunch of bets by the way (laughs) but also like really fucked up the season for Seahawks like can you imagine how much better they would have been if they liter- if they had 16 games of practice with that offense? They, instead, they had eight games, and they were like, "Ah, oh, scrap this. We're going to go Screw with Carlos it. Hyde for eight more games. That paid off. Did? Okay. NFC North win totals. I will start, as we did last time, by reading the current odds to win the NFC North at DraftKings Sportsbook. The Green Bay Packers are the overwhelming favorite, minus 278. Your Minnesota Vikings are the uh, next on the list at plus 400, 4 to 1. The Bears are plus 650, and the Detroit Lions are 25 to 1. Um, any immediate reactions to that? I think the Vikings are undervalued. Oh. I know. I'm playing the long con. I call them trash for four straight years. All the, this was, all the, all the, first off, this was not the reaction I was expecting from you. What you have, have you been 
drinking today? Or? I, I have not been drinking today. Uh, <laughs> what you put in your coffee? Uh, yeah, it was you think Irish. the packings are under uh, the, the Vikings are undervalued? Interesting. I have I have already I already have a ticket. Well, it, it's gone down to four. I have a ticket for them at plus five hundred. Uh, I still think four to one is absurd. You don't think you? <sighs> I think that there's a, a real chance that this division is awful next year. And Kirk Cousins goes like 9-7 and seven and they win the division. You really think the Packers could take that big of a step back? I think that there's better than a 1-4 in four chance that they do, yeah. Interesting. And I mean, that's all I need, right? Like, no, actually, 1-5 in five, Like, I need... Okay. Uh, interesting. Like, the implied probability there is is... Really low. I mean, Here, they were okay. co-favorites to go into the division last year to win it all. Counterpoint. They got the best season they've gotten out of Kirk Cousins last mm-hmm. year. Had a remarkable year out of a rookie wide Justin receiver. Jefferson. Justin Baldwin Jefferson. Dalvin Cook stayed healthy. Dalvin Cook stayed healthy. Mostly played well. And they won, checks notes, seven football games. Yep. They went five and three in one score games. Yep. Um, no thank Which you. most Vikings fans won't tell you that, like, they actually got fairly lucky at they had a lot of injuries on the defensive side of the ball, but to to not be fair to them, they prepared for none of them. I was my takeaway from these odds was I am kind of shocked that the Vikings are are priced this much better than the Bears. They moved so these numbers have moved in the direction away from Green Bay and towards Minnesota. So plus five hundred was the opener. Green Bay was like minus three. 05 or something like that. Um, Bears have mostly stayed pat at this number, and Detroit has ballooned out a little bit. Okay. So the, the quarterback grade for quarterbacks, uh, all quarterbacks, uh, so players that played the quarterback position, the Bears were 26th in the NFL. Mm-hmm. They were the only team, 25th or worse, Mid-level. that went 500 or better. Okay, They won eight games last year. Went six, six in one-score games. That's incredible. There's no, they have to make a move at quarterback. And if they make a move at quarterback, I do think there's a legit shot that Allen Robinson comes back. In which case, this team is a good team. Mm -hmm. They have had terrible quarterback play. Mm -hmm. So if they get decent quarterback play, I have a hard time seeing them being worse than the Minnesota Vikings. Who I I don't think their quarterback play for the Vikings get any better. Yeah. Their passing game isn't going to be more explosive than it was last year. I agree. I'm just saying that we I'm just saying that in a, that we that we've gone from Minnesota being like plus 150 to win the division to plus 500 now to plus 400 based upon a season <clears throat> in which Green Bay performed really really well but in a I, I hate to say unsustainable way but like they draft they have no draft picks from the 2020 draft that are going to contribute much more than running back snaps from AJ Dillon the Vikings drafted 15 players, many of whom sucked last year. Like, we, we look at Justin Jefferson, and he played terrific. But Ezra Cleveland barely played. Um, both corners they drafted were, were a great. liability at times. And, um, you know, guys like Troy Dye were drafted and, you know, were a liability. So you're expecting them to, to be better. Well, I'm just saying, like, it, it, in the, with the principles we believe in, which is that over time you need to draft a lot and draft at valuable positions – as much as I think Minnesota acted like a bunch of, you know, Minnesota had no clue what they were doing last year. The Yannick Ngakwe trade was horrible. Uh, it, tra- tagging Anthony Harris was was a terrible decision. Anthony Hitchens. Uh, trading Stephon Diggs, their best player, I thought was not a good move, even though they ended up being lucky and getting Jefferson. Um, they drafted a lot of players at premium positions last year, and they – in theory, I think long term, those lottery tickets that they they bought will be better than Green Bay's. And Green Bay is just what two years removed from being a six nine and one team. You know, like right, are you done? Okay, I'm just I well, let me you brought you brought up Chicago. Let me talk about Chicago for a second. Yes, all of those are true <laughs> about Chicago. If they get a quarterback. They are. They could be favorites in this division. I would, in fact, think six and a half to one is a good bet. Thank you. What in the history of the Chicago Bears franchise tells you, tells you that, that that's, act, that's ever going to happen? Here's what I'll say. It's 2021. 
weird shit is happening all the fucking <laughs> yeah. time. Okay, you can spend two point five million dollars on a on a fucking highlight on the yeah, internet. Yeah. So you know, I'll just say like crazier shit is happening currently than the Bears getting a good quarterback. It's true. But okay, are you ready? Because I'm about to flip the script. Here. Okay. Okay. You just gave me. Uh, about three minutes on why the Vikings draft last year and the Packers bad draft or lack of draft last year is going to hurt them. However, you're overlooking a very important draft pick by the Green Bay Packers, which was the drafting of A.J. Dillon. <laughs> now, here's why this is really important. They are not going to re-sign Aaron Jones. And Nor that, do they have the money to, by the way. Right. And... That is huge because I think it allows them to address, as cliche as this sounds, a huge area of need for their offense. Their offense was fantastic last year. They were third in EPA per play on first and second down. Aaron Rodgers was as good as he's ever been. And I have some Aaron Rodgers stats here that are just absolutely bonkers. The dude was fucking insane. But in the playoffs, you saw the need for more dynamism on offense. And if they can't understand you know, looking at all of the, the offenses across the league that have two, three, four options in the passing game and see that that's a need, then I just don't know. And I think it's the perfect opportunity. Will Fuller can come on the cheap. I think there's a chance they may be in the draft somewhere. A wide receiver falls. There's some good wide receivers there that they can really make this passing offense better. And I think it all starts with the fact that they go, hey, we got A.J. Dillon, so we don't have to re-sign Aaron Jones. That's my galaxy brain way of saying that their draft actually helps them this year. I would even go further to say that does Jordan Love have trade value? Uh, no, because that, <laughs> I can't get you there. No, I mean he like if this was like the 2013 draft where the only first round caliber player was EJ Manuel, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But you have like Damn, five. At, we just we just talked about for the first like ten minutes how there are five first round quarterbacks this year. Like Jordan Love, where would Jordan Love be picked if he was in this draft? He would be the sixth quarterback. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, oh, like, like very much so. Would he be? Would be? He be ahead or below Kyle Trask? Your guy. Ahead, ahead. Okay. Ahead, you, I, yeah. um, <laughs> Jordan Love, sneaky option to be the Seahawks starting quarterback <laughs> next year. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, my thing, my my thing with these division odds is more like get out ahead of some of them that just the big money ones are have more value than we think. So like. Atlanta was like 11 to 1 when we first mm. saw them. It, you know, Minnesota at 5 to 1 when they're historically always like the second best team in that division. Like they're an injury or two away and then that bet makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if the Vikings get down to like 5 to 2 or 2 to 1, like it's a terrible bet, but yep. at 4 to 1, it, it's worth at least Take a couple a of shekels. All right, you ready to guess these? I am I'm, I'm ready. Let's start with the team we haven't talked about yet, the, the Detroit Lions. I have the Detroit Lions win total last year was 7. With Matt Stafford, they won five incredible games on the back of Matt Patricia. Uh, I have their win total this year, led by the Dan Campbell kneecappers at three and a half, and I think that might be too high. Oh, my. <laughs> I This team is going to suck. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going with the more traditional for the worst team in the league. I'm going to go with five. The, the, bear, the, the Lions' win total is going to be five? I could see a four and a half. If it's five, you're betting on. May the Lord bring yeah. with me all the loaves and fishes, because I'm putting it all. Uh, that's not a saying, but I just got excited. Five? We were talking this last week. Suck. We were talking last week about Austin possibly having to like put you up for a couple days. Like, if you if if you if the Lions go over five, you Dude. are going to be homeless. Okay. <laughs> Let's think about their team last year that won five games. Okay, Matt Stafford, certainly. At, at, he is a better quarterback than Jared Goff. May not be the price that the Rams paid. He's he's a little bit better. Okay, Kenny Galladay probably on his way out. Did they improve at head coach? Yes. Come on. Are we sure about that? I, I'm not Dan sure Campbell about Dan Campbell coached tight ends in New Orleans. I'm not sure about his any. first press conference was about getting beat down, crawling up the proverbial player and biting their kneecap off along the way. Come on. If someone walked in, if you were hiring like a, a entry level position at PFF, and someone came in and talked to you like Dan Campbell talked to you, you'd be fucking laughing your ass off. If I had just fired time. Matt Patricia, I probably I probably would find him endearing. I look, we're talking about Patricia George. I get it, but I mean, there's 
That's like that's like um, I'm trying to think. So you're saying they kind of have the little you when you get rid of a bad coach and you bring in a guy that just has like energy and you get a couple of wins just based on energy is that what I'm you're not saying about? that I'm saying like if you look at the coaching staff like you have and I, I I can't believe I'm saying this but you have former head coaches on the staff like Anthony Lynn not needing Anthony Lynn when he coached the offense at Buffalo is actually fairly good yeah he doesn't have to do the end game decisions he's probably gonna be fine Campbell coached under Peyton as the assistant head coach he has his do Staley many people respect him they also like I, they they just made like they also have like an you know they have they do they do actually fairly solid work as far as decision making and stuff like that. The you mean they have a good analytics staff? I mean, how many kneecaps are they going to have to bite off for Dan Campbell to even venture to their zone of the building? Does Dan Campbell know a name? Of but a we're person not on we're talking about staff. the difference right now between three and a half and five. I'm you yes, know we've already talked too long about it. I'm going to ask you this one last question at seven. Um, who should they take? Um, well, they already signed Tyrell Williams, which I actually think is a fairly yep. good signing for them. Um, they'll Ooh. probably lose Amendola. They'll probably lose Jones and Galladay. Do you think? So they do you think they'll I, take a QV or no? No. See, my thing. See, this is the other thing I think with Goff. I don't think Goff is. I think Goff is bad as a franchise quarterback that you want to have sustained like mm -hmm. he's a rung below Kirk Cousins right but he's not so bad as to be a team lined with four and a half wins going into a season that that's my okay. you know like right because because that's also the issue of like this expectation setting Goff is, was not good enough for the Rams he's more than fine to sort of like you know yeah but Goff was more than fine in an offensive system that aims to make quarterbacks look more than fine and I don't think he's going to get that here. okay uh, but I mean five is five to me so here's the other part reason why I made this number five the rest of the division could be ass okay let's talk about the rest of the division let's go next to the Bears would you have them at seven and a half okay that's exactly what I had as well they were eight last year they went eight and eight now this could obviously change because you know what they end up with at quarterback I was kind of splitting the difference between they get a marginally better quarterback than Mitch Trubisky and they roll with Mitch Trubisky again, which I think underscores the fact that this team is actually pretty good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're a team. Trubisky has taken this team to the playoffs twice in three years, despite the fact that everybody knows he sucks. And But but my my problem is everybody knows he su knew he sucked last year, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and nothing's changed. The only the only thing, and this is why it's so typical Bears right now. We're hearing the reports that says their main objective at the quarterback position is to trade for Russell Wilson. Right. Right. Like they literally don't have a feasible plan at the quarterback position, and they didn't last year. They traded for Nick Foles, who was on the middle of a four-year, eighty-something million-dollar deal. So bad that people are thinking about, hey, look, they Mitch didn't look so terrible. They fucked up the Teddy Bridgewater to, to the point where, like, he was ready to sign there. How, how many wins did the Bears have with Bridgewater at quarterback last year? Well, interesting. So I would go. I would say nine, maybe ten. And, yeah. and the reason I'm saying that is I think there was a little bit of luck there yes. for the Bears, yes. right? But um, they but, they win yeah. the Vikings game on Monday Night Football for They're sure. They're over 500. Yeah, and like the Bears have been a you could swing a dead cat and hit a good decision, and they still can't freaking do it. That's the thing. Like, so but this there are season, options. So there's yeah, Teddy. there are options, but the Bears there's Cam Newton have never taken. Oh, sorry, they've never like made the good decision at the position. They, you know, I mean, Since they, Jim McMahon, they haven't made a good decision at the. Uh, I wonder if they'll be more incentivized though, because like losing, I guess maybe they don't really care, but like losing Allen Robinson would be a huge loss for them. He's awesome, I, and there's no way that that guy wants to play with Mitch Trubisky or I, Nick Foles again. I think the big thing, if you're a Bears fan, which you should both be happy about and up, upset about, is that Pace and Nagy don't have much leash left, and so. A, a a Wilson trade in Long Gates said leash, and that might be what they need That's maybe to get them to do it. it. Because otherwise, I mean, they're if they fail the Wilson thing, 
they're just trying to get on the green, baby. That's it, right? And, like, hope the Bears falter and you get another 2018 season where mm. you're really not a contender, but you're in the playoffs and everybody's yeah. happy. The smart Bears fans are like, oh, fuck, we're still in purgatory. But for them, they get to keep their job for another year. To me, like, Wilson's a lucky out here. And, the, and I don't even know if they're, they're willing to take it. Minnesota Vikings. Win total was nine last year. <laughs> Didn't it open it? Did it open it nine and a half? Yes. And we hammered the under. And they won seven games, went seven and nine last year. They almost I, hit my six and ten mark. I remember you were on Caller's podcast and said seven and nine. So you nailed it. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I have them at eight. I have them at eight as well. I think Cousins is a good enough quarterback where eight is an expectation every year. It, Cousins, Jeff Fisher, eight and eight, seven and nine, just mark it. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, like Cousins' numbers looking so much better than their record it's just perfect it says everything you need to know well and and i'll say this like vikings fans like to give us a lot of shit because well especially me because i'm like we're not poo-pooing cousins cousins is cousins is is emblematic of the poor decision making the vikings actually a vikings fan has never once given me shit yeah well the because because it's like we're not talking about qb wins like we're not evaluating Cousins based upon his no. his win total. We're evaluating the Vikings' decision to take a 2017 season where their defense was healthy and the best of all time, and or best of that season, and saying we can keep this variable fixed while increasing another variable, which anybody know solving simultaneous equations knows you can't do anyone, anybody, any of you out a there and currently so, doing this. And so now we go from, oh my gosh, the defense is the best defense in football to now being like, oh look, our quarterback is a top 10 quarterback. And it's like, yes, but you have, you, the one came at the expense of the other and you're still not a winning franchise. And that's, and that's really the problem. And that's like what Kirk Cousins on field success is emblematic of the fact that it still came at a price that was way too like it's like me buying a Porsche it has no utility for me I don't know you kind of look good in a Porsche yeah. rolling around I, here's my thought on the, the Vikings you look at this Vikings team you go okay how does this Vikings team compete for a Super Bowl well I'll tell you how they don't paying Kirk Cousins top five quarterback money it, it's just not going to happen so you're sitting there at 14. Let's say, you know, okay, let's say people love Mac Jones. Maybe Trey Lance falls. Like at 14, you've got to be thinking about or at least willing to move up a couple of yeah. spots and and pick one of these quarterbacks because if you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, we went 7 and 9 last year in Kirk Cousins' best season. Like I I don't understand how you can rationally you have then 14 touchdowns out of Adam Thielen who's like I mean, the, the, the how can you look at yourself and go, off. we're going to win a Super Bowl at some point? Well, and here's the other thing that makes it very, very tough for Minnesota. Okay. The, the, the mo like his salary becomes like year plus one guaranteed, or, you know, in the previous year. Like, I can't remember which day of the calendar, football calendar, is like fifth or something. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is if they commit to Cousins like this offseason, they're basically committed to him for the the duration of the deal. His cap number in 2022 is $45 million. Yeah. And that's, you know. But they can save 35 by cutting him. Save 35 by cutting him this year or next year? Next year. Okay. So so I guess if they go, like, so they go to pick 14 this year. Like, this is what was in my original mock when we you know mm -hmm. first came up with them independently. I had Lance going to the Vikings at 14. And... Like I think that makes a little bit of sense if you can if sense. you can cut Kirk. They, the problem is, is again, much like Chicago, Spielman and Zimmer are in a similar position to Pace oh, and Nagy. So? I mean, not as bad. It's not as bad, but I mean, interesting. I I, I do think though they're they're in a win now situation too. Like, they are, but if you draft Trey Lance, you're in a maybe you extend it a little bit. Yeah, the, the problem is, is the Zimmer, Sp well Spielman especially. Spielman is whiffed at the quarterback position now three times right um you know uh, ponder uh, bridgewater and he's kind of like kind of bradford as well and then now cousins cousins isn't a swing and a miss from a the particular player's perspective he's more of a you made a minus four thousand money line bet you know, right, <laughs> right but all right packers last year their win total um, nine was eight and a half i believe yeah, nine, nine in some spots. They, them and the Vikings were co-favorite. Vikings closed as favorites to win the NFC North last year. 
Yeah, so depending on where you went, 8.5-9, they obviously won 13. I thought this was crazy. Uh, they only played six one-score games. They absolutely blew people out or got blown out. And they only times. played two well, – they only – I guess the they Bears counted as, as a box. playoff team, but, like, they only played two games against teams with winning records, right? And they were 2-0, and oh, both Sunday night games, no. Saints and Titans. Bucks. That's right. They only beat two. Uh, mm. Only beat two uh, teams with winning records, and those are both Saints and Bucks. What do you Saints have? Saints and um, Titans. Um, I have ten and a half. That's what I have as well. Um, that is not us saying that we hate the Green Bay Packers. That's a very good line. So if we're looking back at all of our um, projected p- guessing the win totals here for 2021. Ten and a half is the highest that either of us have given anyone. Of course, we haven't gotten to the AFC West yet, but um, ten and a half is a really, you know, like that is a solid number. Winning eleven games is very impressive and hard to do. And you look at Aaron Rodgers, and I mean, he was so fantastic. He ninety-five point one PFF grade, his highest PFF grade ever. Eight um, percent of his throws were big time throws, which was even better than than twenty fourteen. Um, some other really crazy stats. So throwing the ball downfield 20 plus yards note noting who his receivers were 43 percent of those throws and he had the most throws uh downfield uh in the nfl were big time throws league average is about 30 percent and then i think this one was really impressive his big time throws on first reads and i think this is where they can improve was double the league average he was incredible mm-hmm. but where do they go when Devonte adams doesn't absolutely destroy a cornerback off the line. I think that's the big well, it question. It was Tanyan for a lot of the season, but he kind of fizzled at the end. I mean, the other big one that was really interesting was he had like six or seven more touchdowns than the next best quarterback on the first two drives of a game. Like they were, you know, we talked about in the Tampa Bay game, both in the NFC Championship game but leading up to it, how untested they were in games where they got behind. And that was like partially because they absolutely just raked in the first part of games. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. Like, and and that was a that's characteristic of Lafleur, where you know in the, the scripted plays, he's terrific. So um, I wonder if if they ever go stale, is that the first thing that goes stale, and then it becomes more like a 2018 situation where they're playing more from behind and Rodgers isn't as comfortable all game. If it's ten and a half, um, you had to bet one side. What are you betting? Uh, under, yeah, I, I, Rogers is just a, you know, Rogers is a player where I think his look, like we're going to talk about points bet at some point. Like, obviously if you bet under in a points bet and like it, like you, you lose, you know, more and more and more of the wins. Like I could see this team being a 14 win team, but like, I can also see this team kind of just like struggling to eight or nine wins. Um, because you're not going to get – I mean, Amos is the most valuable safety. Alexander, the most valuable corner. Um, they're going to lose Lindsley, it sounds like, most valuable center in football, Bakhtiari coming off of a knee injury. And there's no guarantee that even if they put investments, whether that be draft capital or free agent capital, into the wide receiver position, there's no guarantee that those players work. Right? So there's a lot there that I think that they're building off of. Um, you know, they're, we're, we're looking at them as 26-6 and six over the last two years. And – I still don't think that for any team that should be the baseline. I have a real hard time going under after kind of looking at the rest of the division, though. I guess that's kind of my problem. And Aaron Rodgers is so much better than the other quarterbacks in this division that it's like kind of laughable. And I do think that um, there's reason to believe maybe he doesn't have as incredible of a season, but if they give him a few more weapons, I don't see why he can't still be, you know, top three with a bullet. Um, and, and maybe even improve in some areas. Um, all right, that was our show. Uh, Wednesday, Chris Sims is going to come on, and we are going to talk about his quarterback ranking. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's not going to be some like, you know, hey, we're going to undress Chris Sims sort of deal. Mm. Um, this is going to be a fun conversation. Um, he legitimately goes in without looking at anyone else's rankings, watches the quarterbacks, and evaluates them. And so it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to talk, obviously, about all the different quarterbacks. Kellen Mond, a guy that he really likes. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. So tune in. Good discussion of anchoring, right? Like mm-hmm. where you're thinking about if you go in completely unbiased, you know, I think that that has some value to it. 
even though I'm a big time wisdom of the crowds guy, I think that what Sims is doing and Sims has had good success. Like if you look back at his quarterback rankings over the past few years, there's a lot there to like. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a discussion with him. Uh, obviously we'll, we'll ask him uh, stories about what it's like to play with Bruce. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see you guys. Peace out.